But this afternoon for our final 2018 lecture, we're presenting something that is probably new to you. Maria Thomas and her partner Rick Roberts are here to explain and introduce the art of Zentangle. Maria Thomas has been a professional artist since childhood. Rick and Maria sold prints of Maria's botanical illustrations at art fairs, and Maria would inscribe each one sold to a as a customer watched her amazing, beautiful lettering. Many said they wished they could do that. In the fall of 2003, Rick, who has practiced meditation for many years, noticed that as Maria added, pa added patterns to the background of a large gilded letter, she was experiencing all the classic aspects of a meditative flow state. That was the beginning of the Zentagel method of drawing. You are probably think thinking, what on the earth is Zentangel? According to Maria and Rick, Zentangle's an easy to learn, relaxing, and fun way to create beautiful images by drawing repetitive structured patterns. Maria and Rick say that anyone can use the Zentangle method to create beautiful images. It is enjoyed all over the world across a wide range of skills, interests, and ages. Today, there are over 3,000 certified Zentangle teachers available in over 40 countries. Even if you think you can't draw, Maria Thomas and Rick Roberts are here to show you how almost anyone can create something unexpected and beautiful in about 15 minutes using the Zentangle method. Please welcome the founders of Zentangle, Maria Thomas and Rick Roberts. Hi. So we want, oh, could you move that little card? Thank you. So this is the National Museum of American Illustration, or Illustrators, right? Illustr illustration. illustration. Okay. Right. And this is, this is an American illustrator. <laughs> I am so excited about being here because these are all my peeps. This is what I've done my whole life. I'm so excited that I can see that it's a, a real art form because a lot of times people, like you said, didn't, um, didn't really look at it as, as a serious art form. And for me, it was the only art form. It, I, I, I raised my kids with this. I, I made a really great living at this in a commercial atmosphere. Uh, and I loved it. I loved everything I did. Um, and so she would do lettering illustrations and she would do invitations. Oh, I had a, uh, my, my big gig was that I, I was a, uh, a stationary designer and I had my own line of stationary and we had the pleasure of doing a lot of really famous people. And uh, one of the neat things about this invitation is that when Maria first started designing um, <coughs> invitations, she went to Crane Stationery and suggested that she paint flowers on invitations. And they sent her away and they said, no one does that, please, no, please go no away. No, there was no color. Uh, stationery, wedding stationery was white or ecru and that was it, in black. And I said, yeah, but, and they said, and they, they turned me away. And then, well, I don't know, maybe five years later, they came knocking at my door and said, now Which was like, after she had won then, Best so of Show. And then I created a whole line of stationery for them, including my handmade... Uh, handmade Which was after you won Best of Show at yeah, the New York Stationery yeah. Show. Yeah. And here's another one. This was Ted Turner's 70th birthday party, and he flew us down there so she could put the, uh, the names on the menus at the last minute. Oh, this was really cool. Um, Brides Magazine uh, was giving off a, uh, a wedding of a lifetime. They, it was a rat, like a, a contest, and um, they would win a wedding at the at Walt Disney uh, in in Florida, and the the wedding would take uh, the wedding would take place in the in the castle, and it would be it was the first time that a bride and groom s actually slept upstairs in the castle 
um, as part of this giveaway. And what the giveaway was that they were going to do the perfect wedding, which was the best place, the best food, which was Tyler Florence, and then the, the flowers were somebody I don't remember, which were kind of but, odd. And the best calligrapher. And the, be the best <laughs> wedding invitations, which they called me and said that they, and this is what it looked like. It, it was so spectacular, and they let me do anything I wanted. And um, it, was the, it was a cool thing, and we, we got to go to the wedding. And she also designed another, several other lines of stationery. And some of her botanical illustrations were made into many different things, including plates. Again, this is the classic definition of illustration, in, in that they were all images that were made for reproduction. And here's a little bits of insight into her portfolios. And what's important to look at is some of the images that are in her sketches will show you where they are here in the museum. And you'll also see how they found their way into the art that became Zentangle. Some of her alphabets. And this image on the left is a Christmas card. And the first person that figures out why it's a Christmas card gets a free book. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> it's tough, but so you, you want to read it out loud, even to yourself. Okay. There's what? No, there's Noel. There's Noel. There's Noel. <laughs> uh, okay, see me afterwards. See us afterwards, <laughs> yeah. Our, the first uh, time that Rick and I actually performed together was at the... Uh, at Fort Adams. Fort Adams, and, and we, we, we were going to show you okay. the kind of things we did. So I'm going to switch this. This is like really cool high-tech stuff. Right. So what happens, and we had a booth, you know, selling at a, a craft fair, and people would come and they would choose one of my botanical illustrations, and I'd say, okay, what do you want me to write? And I would write it there right in front of them, and, and I am a, an exuberant calligrapher, and if you, with, uh, cr it's crazy, and, and, and this, was what we're going to show you, it takes me about two minutes. So she had, here's like an image and this was one of the most popular ones because she would write on it, you know, a couple's name and then the perfect pair, right? So we have, inside, we have inside sources here um, via an email and our clever Lauren and, Lauren and <laughs> Nathan, <laughs> the perfect pair. Can you, can you make it so you can see the whole thing? Well, here. <laughs> Lauren and Nathan. So they just got engaged. <laughs> okay, so I think at this point we will, um, you want to tangle and I'll do sure. some, some talking. And He's Zen and I'm tangled. I talk, she draws. Sometimes she talks, sometimes I draw. As Julie had said, this started, well, let me go back to the, uh, uh, the Fort Adams. When Maria was doing this lettering, all of these people would come up and they would say, basically, I wish I could do what you're doing. And if I could do that, that beautiful lettering, it would be so fulfilling to me. And we remembered that. I'm, I have to cut this story a little short here. One Saturday, Maria is in her office doing the, a big, beautiful, gilded letter, and she's putting in this little patterns inside the inside of the letter. And I interrupted her after she had been doing that for a couple hours. And she came out of what is best described as this relaxed focus, you know, like, like she had just woken up from a big nap. And as she s described what she was doing, I noticed, well, that's, you're describing meditation. And she had never, ever sat to do meditation. 
ever. But she was describing that same sense of what's now called a flow state of, you know, selflessness, effortlessness, timelessness, and deep meaning that was coming out of what she was doing. So that discovery, coupled with the fact that the patterns she was doing were these really simple patterns, not unlike what she's doing here, very repetitive strokes. So we tried to figure out, well, we knew that all of those people at Fort Adams that said, oh, I wish I could do that, could do what she's doing now. And because of what she had been experiencing while she was drawing these very simple things, she wasn't, didn't have to worry about how it was spelled. She didn't have to worry about, is it on the line? When do I finish? Well, I'm filling this space that's already defined. And we said, you know, if we could put this in a method, maybe those people that wanted to create but felt that they couldn't might get something out of it. So we put together a little kit and we gave classes. To anybody who would have us. Anybody. We, <laughs> we would go to museums. We would go, no, no, museum. We would go to libraries. We'd go to bookstores. We schools. would go to schools. And we basically did it for free, just to learn how this works. And then word spread. And interestingly, we've never advertised. It's all been word of mouth. You know, the internet has helped, but this has become this worldwide phenomenon because people, I believe, want to be creative. They're built to be creative. And, you know, not to, not to get to anything, but part of our Western traditions in both Judaism and Christianity is that God created us in his likeness and image. So the story goes. Well, the one thing you know about that is that we must therefore be creators. And when we don't create, something is lost both to us personally and to the world, I believe. And part of the reason that I think that idea is correct is after 15 years, we have so many stories of people calling up and saying, you saved my life, you saved my daughter's life, I stopped doing these things that weren't good for me, I now manage my pain, I now manage my addictions stuff we never expected. And I think it's because when somebody creates and feels what Lidecker and Parrish and these people felt when they put pen to paper, brush to canvas, that is our human birthright. And whether you're going to be Parrish or not, you can always express something creatively and that heals and it just feels good. And you end up doing something that you didn't think you could. One of our first things that we did is we went and taught at a uh, high school in Providence. We did every single class, and before each class, we'd show people what we're going to teach you. Every single kid said, there's no way I can do that. After a half hour, every kid had done what they knew they couldn't do. And so then we asked them, what else do you know you can't do? And it's a really deep question because once you realize you can do something that you knew you couldn't, maybe other things that you know you can't, you can do as well. And so that is, I think, the deeper message of this. That is the deeper reason for the success the natural spreading of, of what Zentangle has become. Um, let's see. Oh, I've got this slide. So since I have the slide, I have to show it to you, right? We did this list of 10 because these were the 10 excuses that everybody gave us why they couldn't be an artist. When, when people would come to 
see us uh, when we were doing these uh, craft fairs, they would come up, almost always come up, watch what I was doing, clutch their chest, their heart, and they'd say, oh, if only I could do that, I would be happy. If only I could be creative, if only I could make beautiful things, I would be happy. And they said, but I can't because. And then they would start listing all the excuses, and they were, they were probably legitimate in their minds. And we were listening to all of this, and we kept notes. And we, they, it was the same excuses over and over and over, so that when we, dis, uh, when we uh, designed the kit, the, the, kit the process, and, and the process and everything, we took into account all the excuses they gave us so that they could never use those excuses ever again. <laughs> so if it was, I don't have the time. Well, it takes 15 minutes to do a, a beginner's untangle tile. I don't have the space. It's three and a half inches square. I don't have the ability. We're going to show you exactly what to do in the beginning. Uh, I don't have the money. It's three and a half inches square of paper. It, the tools, it's a pen and a paper and a pencil. I mean, it, you don't have to buy big sets of paints. You don't have to buy turning wheels. You don't have, it's a really, inexpensive art form. We, we weren't in this for the money. We were in this because we had to do this. So uh, all the rest of the things, the space, it's three and a half inches. Patience, three yeah. and a half inches. And, and this is like our like encouragement to you is when we had that idea on that Saturday, we at least recognized that it was really important. And so we went out and bought a blank book we made a reservation at a hotel in Western Massachusetts. <laughs> Any excuse. <laughs> and we went there, and the whole way there, all the time there, and all the time coming back, we just wrote what we were talking about in the book, as if it was dictation. And we it didn't felt change. Like we were taking dictation from it, somewhere. We didn't change anything. We designed and the entire thing in one weekend and never changed it. And so part of it is the we made steps and the first and the last part of it is gratitude and appreciation and that really puts you into you know appreciating the time that you can make to create something for your tools for yourself for your environment um, and then we begin by we have this whole method that is really designed to use limits to inspire creativity. So by creating limits that are very simple to begin with, that anybody can do, you both access the method simply and it inspires paradoxically creativity to the point that, so this is one of the posters that we did because after that school experience, there was the idea that, well, anything is possible one stroke at a time. So we would look at, you know, like the school with the kids. Well, could you build the school? No. Well, then look at it, break it down into, into subparts. Could you put this screw in that hole? Could you put this carpet and roll it out? And we discovered that there was no single thing that any student couldn't do given, you know, physical ability. Another aspect of Zentangle is we look at patterns as colors. So this is Maria's work of a color wheel, but with patterns. So I, when I was growing up, I had uh, uh, recurring dreams. And the dreams that I would have were always that I had discovered a new color a new color that nobody had ever seen, had ever heard of. It couldn't even be re reproduced. It was, uh, it was so valuable that people, you know, it started to get scary. And so the dream started really great, and then it got a little scary. But, uh, but then once we, f we discovered Zentangle, we figured, oh, this must be the new color that, we, that I discovered, you know? And uh, so this was a, a tribute to that dream. And, the, that and then you never had the dream I again. Never, I never right. had the dream again, right. Mm -hmm. It's really cool. So, so anyway, the, this is set up so that it, it um, I don't know if you can see it, but in each section is a tangle, and then you can see where, um, so you can see the leaves up there, and this, this here, and you put them together, and you get that. So then you take this one and this one, put it together, and get this one. And so it works all the way around. 
so that it, they, you can blend tangles uh, like, you be, like you blend colors. And one of the things that we... He always uses the word we. We. <laughs> it's, it's like I say we made supper, yeah. right? <laughs> um, but the, we call these patterns tangles. We made up a whole language. Each of them has a name. And this one in the lower right with the blue is called Hollabaugh. And it's designed by its name because our son-in-law, Nick Hollabaugh, came up with it. And it's drawing behind. And it's a very simple pattern. You just draw two lines, then draw two lines behind that, and you just keep going. But the inspiration for that is nature draws in behind. Almost never will you see a tree with woven branches, for instance. So we, the point of that is we take inspiration from nature, we take inspiration from fabric, Artists. from frames, from and so here uh, we go. Uh -oh. Maybe like, what was it, a couple months ago, we had somebody visiting from London. And the one thing we wanted to show them was this museum. Wales. From Wales. Wales. And we drive down, we pull up on the road right out there, and the gate is closed. Well, then this car comes out of the, of the driveway, and I can't see the sign. So, okay, I'm going to go up there. And this couple is in the car. This couple is in the car. <laughs> And Lawrence says, can I help you? So they look at each other, <laughs> and they say, we'll give you a half an hour. <laughs> and that was our introduction here, and they wow. took us through the museum. And, and, and um, two hours later. Or whatever, yeah. Right? And they were so gracious and wonderful, wonderful. And so in getting to know them, they asked us to come and do this presentation. So, that, so that's that this, the, like, the tumbling synchronicities. Mm -hmm. And and so he it here was great. we are. It was great. So, Earlier this week, we came down and asked, can we go around and take some images because we really want to connect the Zentangle experience or way of seeing the world. We want you to see how we would see this museum and to inspire you to notice things perhaps that you wouldn't otherwise notice. So we, I just want to add something yes. here. Yes, <coughs> okay. I love to draw in museums, okay? I love to Whoops. walk around with my little book and, um, you know, you, it's just the, it, the feeling of being around greatness and being able to just feel one little piece of that. And so I go around museums and, and granted, I if I was to tell you to do it, you'd say, well, what? I can't draw any of these things. I can't draw any of these things. But well, we're going to show you what you can draw and still get that same feeling when you're walking around, you can go to one painting and pick out one little tiny thing. It might be the, the bristles on this broom, or it might be um, the pattern right here, or it might be, and that's what you can do. You can appreciate the tiny little bits of art one at a time instead of the overall beautiful, beautiful, overwhelmingly intimidating painting. You know, and, I used to think, I, did, I would go look at the statue of David, right? And that's art. Well, I can't do that. I guess I'm not an artist. It's a leap initially too far. So you break it down into these small things. The smallest, tiny, silly little things. And, and there is so much to see here beyond the faces and the paintings and the, it, everywhere. Everywhere, this, this place is like, you just, just look at the moldings and everything. It's just mm -hmm. unbelievable. So this image, is the carpet in the, in the tea salon. So these sort of like beautiful shapes are resonant with one of our tangles that we teach, which we call flux. And we have this system of step outs that we teach, you know, instructions, first you do this, then you do that. It's all wordless, by the way. It's only with arrows. No, there's no spoken language when we're teaching it in our books and stuff, so that anybody, anybody, anywhere can learn this. And the idea is that each single stroke is something that is probably in your signature. 
So all of our patterns are built of either a dot, a line, a curve, an S shape, or an orb. So if you can write your name, you, you already can do, can do all of the parts, and we just show you how to put it together. So let's take a walk around the museum just a little bit and look. So this is an image from the, from the floor below, and there's two things, many things, but two things I want to point out in this image is the frame, that resonant ripple. Um, yeah, remember we call it auraing, in that it's like you drop a pebble into a pool, or you look at a cross section of a tree, or you look at this frame. And then, if you look at that boat at the end of the buttstock of the rifle, there's this odd random pattern there. And as I understand it, that was painted on the ships as a form of camouflage to deceive the um, periscope sighting so that it was less obvious the direction and the distance to um, shoot torpedoes at. Patterns, right? Here's another image. And one of the things that I think we want to point out is, OK, you see these images, you see the guy, you see what's going on. But when we look at these, we also look at things that might be not so obvious, which is that texture pattern in the man's cap. And to become conscious of that and then think, oh, well, if I were to represent that or represent that, how might I do it in a really simple way? So a lot of this is just bringing awareness to see things in your world that maybe were always there, but just escape notice. And these are all some beautiful images, very small sections, or larger sections. In uh, Parrish's paintings in the big series of the, is it the FET series? Um, he uses these checkerboardy black and white, but they're actually not black and white, but at first you think they are, but they're not. And these rich, rich, beautiful graphic images jump off the canvases and in your face, and you're thinking, oh my God, this guy is really ballsy to do this, right? And it, but it's, it's what makes it so amazing. And he, he does it in each one of them. You can see that graphic thing jumping out. It's so spectacular. This is just, just one, one frame, frame OK? <laughs> just one frame. Look at the patterns. And there is so much going on in this. And we're going to show you later some of the things that we did with this. But I got to tell you this funny story. This, these little whorls here. I was down at a river the other day, and I'm watching. The river comes around, and it's got this tumult, and these little vortexes happen in the river. And I swear, I, I tried to take pictures of them. I couldn't, but they were, they were lined up exactly like that. And when you see patterns, you start to notice them in nature. You start to notice them in the guy's tie who's the teller at the bank. or. You see you, patterns you, you become more conscious of the world that you're in. And this is just such a wonderful example of, you know, the painting is gorgeous. The painting is, is beautiful. And how is it framed? And you can also think of that as a metaphor of how we frame what we see just in general. Or every time Nathan looks through the camera, he's making a decision of how am I going to frame this shot? So how do we frame what we see? This is a really cool one. You can, you can see the crab, but you can see, again, that overlapping scalloping and the, OK, if you can see Be careful. the sense of humor of the person that made the frame, perhaps, he put scallops in the scalloping. So uh, Judy, who, this, this was. Right, but the frame was made, a custom-made frame for the painting, right? And here's another image. So framing in itself is, is such an art form, because I was a framer too, you know, in past life. 
and um, just matching a frame to a painting, that the art of it is unbelievable. And, and uh, Judy was kind enough to lend me a book about it. And um, some of the most famous framers, the stories of what they, their art form, they're, they're as much into it as any painter or anything else. That's, that's their thing. I'm okay. And Thanks. so you, yeah. what this does is it makes you appreciate all the things people have done in the world. The guy that designed the, the, the molding. How many times do you ever even think about that stuff? But somebody does this for a living. Somebody puts their passion, all of their love into their work. And you can see it in all the old mansions and things. Not so much today. Today, everything is done really, really fast and, and simplified into things. But ah, I love all this wonderful pattern making and, and uh, illuminations and, and, and decorations. So when you go into the sunroom where many of the FET paintings are, or when you go down to the, the store, I'm sure you'll all go down to the store in the lower level, notice also the, uh, the knobs, the handles on the doors. And this is just a beautiful pattern that we will um, show you what we did with this. Here's a few more. This one was especially pretty. It was so three-dimensional. It's not something you would expect on a frame. It's so pretty, and it was really. I think this is on. This is a molding on one, around one of the windows in one of the rooms here. So we will leave it to you to find <laughs> find them after the it's program. Like, where's Waldo? Yes. <laughs> And then this was also in the library, and there's a lot going on here. You've got all these parallel lines, whether it's in the blinds or in the hanging string, and then you've got at the top the reflection of those waves. But not only uh, the, the vertical lines, but also these wonderful patterns that are going behind here, and one of them going in front here. And that is so much fun to do when you're drawing. And it's uh, inspired by seeing something so mundane. You would probably never look at this twice. But uh, the whole idea that you can get inspired to draw that, it's just a diff another whole world. And this is one of the Tiffany lamps in the library. Again, shapes, beautiful, swirling, whirling shapes. This frame with this... Uh, these undulating reflected patterns. And for anybody familiar with Zentangle, you're going to re realize, oh, well, I know that pattern. This is like static, one of the patterns that we teach. Here's a pattern that we teach, is we call it floors, because it looks just like our kitchen floor that we what inspired the pattern on how to draw. But notice that diamond shape And here again is that same diamond shape, unnoticed perhaps because of the grandeur of the uh, acanthus brass, but that's that's in this room right over right over here. And again, the acanthus leaf, which is also we have a tangle called I can this. <laughs> <laughs> so what, what what I did was. I, I looked at, I mean, there are whole classes, week-long classes you can take on how to draw acanthus leaves. And they're, they're all over art because they, they're, they're structurally so easily uh, manipulated. Um, but there's a way of drawing them, but it's really complicated. But I discovered a way to do this really easily that anybody could do in, in a minute. And it's passable for some of the stuff that mm -hmm. I've seen here, uh, which I'll, I'll show you after. So here's another acanthus on the frame of a mirror in the that room, one, in the ballroom. Why would I do an acanthus? Thing? Yeah, well, we'll let's do that, an acanthus. Uh, um, and then we're going to have some spines here and there. And I'm just going to do a simplified version of one. So I'm going to draw a U-shape in the corners where these spines meet. So you can do that, right? That's easy. So far, anything I'm doing is stuff that you can do. These U-shapes just fit wherever there's a corner. That So 
So now I'm going to put a, a sort of a hat on the, on the top curved hat, like a, the top of an onion onion dome, is that what they call it? Onion called? dome, yeah. yeah. On the top of each of these. So you can do that, right? Sound, here comes the magic. This is the coolest thing in the world, okay? So pretend you just had five cups of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we can do this, right? So we're going to start at the bottom. Five cups of coffee, right? <laughs> right? Up to the U and meet up here. Go to the other U. Coffee, 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 coffee. <laughs> and we're just meeting up with these U's. And I actually can feel this coffee I just had before we started here. But we can do, you can do that, right? It, 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 actually, the, the wigglier, the better. Acanthus leaf. Wow. Right? So, Rick, we should show them what it looks like again. So uh, what happened with the acanthus leaves are very, very complicated. And uh, as time wore on, it became depicted in, in so many different ornamental things that they became something else. So they actually, most of the, most of the ones that are in art and in, in uh, architecture and things like that look more like the one I did than an actual real acanthus leaf. So that was, that's like the fun stuff. We, what we do, what Rick and I do, is we look at patterns, we find them, we break them down into really simple um, uh, so steps. So we, we call it deconstructing the pattern. And Real simple to steps. find it, what are the key elemental strokes that make up this pattern so that anybody sort of in an erector set sort of way, well, you do this line and then you do that line and you know that you can do all of the components and all of a sudden this something is coming out from your hand that you previously didn't think you could do. And that's a pretty deep, a lot of deep stuff happens then. And it, it's very, very good. So when we first started this, we, we had no idea where it was going. We thought it was going to be big in the schools with kids trading cards and stuff. It didn't even do that. It went right to adults. Adults really needed this. This is stuff they wanted to do all their lives, didn't have the time, had kids, had full-time jobs, didn't have the money, didn't have the place. They wanted this. They wanted this. And so now we have people all over the world doing this, and I didn't expect this. It has become so beautiful because we see it on, on the Internet. We see everybody's work. And people who have said, I have not been an artist, I've never picked up a pen, I've never done this, are doing pieces that are so amazingly beautiful. I can't even tell you. Once you go home, you can write Google Zentangle, and it's everywhere, and they're so, so beautiful. I wasn't so, expecting that. Yeah, and bizarre story. So a quick story. Um, we got Honey, a, I don't do quick stories. stories. Quick. <laughs> I, I'm going to make it. <laughs> <laughs> China, far in the northwest oh, of China. There was um, one of our teachers went to a village there, and there was going to be some official person coming, and they wanted to do something beautiful in the village. And so she this was. This is in the middle of nowhere. No, like, really, okay, what are we going to do? Barely Didn't have running pens, water. Yeah. nothing. So they went to the river, and they got this really beautiful dark ochre clay. And then they got these grass reeds, and they made brushes out of them. And then she taught the kids basic tangles, like 
Maria has done or things that you see in the museum and the kids started tangling those stucco walls of all the buildings the in the outside village. Outside of the houses. They tangled the, an entire village. And then it was their teachers, right? The kids taught their teachers how to do it. And the, the adults learned from the kids. And we have pictures on the website. I, we I would have brought that. But it is the most beautiful thing. And all from people who weren't quote unquote artists. And, and they used, they used beautiful. stuff that they had. They had mud. That's all they had. They, they barely had water. Yeah. It, if you saw this, I've never seen such a remote village. And, and they were like stucco edge, uh, like huts. Yeah. And once they put these patterns on, they were so beautiful. And you see a picture of these kids and they got these big smiles. Yeah. And oh, it was just so unbelievable. So one of the messages of this is that... Oh, and the big message. Wait, wait, yeah, what, what? Big, she didn't speak the language that these kids oh, did. Oh, right. They, she taught the whole thing just by showing them. Never, but couldn't speak She spoke words. Mandarin, but they didn't speak Mandarin. Yeah. Right? So I included this picture. It's, it's from, the, from the Sun Room because this is something that's probably in your house. This very, there's patterns everywhere. There's patterns to be noticed, to be appreciated, to be, how can I rep represent that, perhaps? Um, you saw this. And then we had a chance when we were walking here to go outside from the sunroom and look up. And this is the example, if you remember, when I mentioned earlier that nature draws in a holobah fashion, or it draws behind. So every branch, the nearer branches, the further branches are behind. It's drawn behind. And by the way, this is the largest fern leaf beach in the United oh, States. Oh, in the United States. I'm sorry. And yeah. it's on the a trees, if you didn't know, have a national registry, by the way. Um, the application process is very slow because the tree, it takes a while for it to fill the forms out. But this tree filled the form <laughs> out and it is on the National Registry. If you have seen, there's this, I don't know, how many of you have seen the little tape that plays, it's like a 10 minute tape here? I so know it by heart. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so in that tape, they have the image of daybreak. And at some point, Whoopi Goldberg is talking about the structure that underlies the paintings. And this is a very um, synchronistic part of Zentangle because the first thing that you do when you create Zentangle art is you put dots in the corner. What you saw me do at the beginning, remember dots? and then the border, and then this scribble in the middle. And that sets up an underlying structure that becomes like a lattice work to support your creativity. It provides both limitations, but also a structure from which you can build from. And seeing this image, before he created this, piece, I don't want to presume that it was like dot border string, but there was that sense of what is the underlying structure uh, over which I will create this final piece that we don't see visually. But as you look at Zentangle art, you will notice the disappeared string that's holding the patterns. And as you go and look at these images, you might also consider what types of underlying structures the artist might have had in mind as they were putting it together. Because there's, there's a lot of, of deep stuff going on there. This wasn't just random pencil lines. This guy was deep into sacred geometry and okay. uh, so sacred proportions. Everybody, close your eyes. <laughs> I want to show you this because it's too cool. Um, okay, now open your eyes. <laughs> I did a little analysis of that as best I could. The, um, the proportions of that layout. 
are in a Fibonacci proportion or sacred geometry proportion. There are ratios of, in fact, I believe this room is as well, it yeah. is the width is to the length as the length is to the total width plus length. That's the proportion. That's the proportion. And, and everywhere in this building. In this, in this, just these few that I looked at, as best as I could, because it wasn't shot 90 degrees on, that horizontal top and the right red vertical are in Fibonacci proportion. On the left, the two verticals that are in the same proportion, and on the right here, they're in the same proportion. So there is like deep thought that goes into this behind the scenes. And so it's, it's worthy to, to think, okay, we see this, but what's behind it? You see that beach out front, but there's root systems that you don't see that's holding it up. There's things going on. And so that's part of the inspiration from a Zentangle approach is we first build this structure. We call it a string. A string. Like everything is built on the, on the string. We have this same approach or the same idea of structure to Zentangle. And this was a piece that Maria had done. Um, for a Christmas card, right? For a Christmas card, Peas on, on, on Earth. On Earth. Yeah. Um, and we combined it with Zentangle art, intimating the idea that there is a structural resonance under everything. And, and she had done this piece without thinking of that, and I just put it together in Photoshop, but you notice those little circles that are in that, on the Zentangled part, resonate with the peas up there. It's the same, it's the same image, and the world is patterns, and this museum is patterns. And so our, our goal was to, to show some of the things that um, were in there, and we put this piece together. Do you want to do that first? Do you want to do that, or, or, or you want to show? I'm just going to show the, the, yeah, sh the separate okay. ones. Okay. So we had gone through those images that you had seen. So one of them was the acanthus, which we call I can this instead of I can't this, <laughs> and this was the one that Rick was uh, alluding to about the river. And part of what's important to notice is that there are no strokes in there that any one of you couldn't have done. So it opens up a whole world. It's, 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 if you look at any of these paintings, oh, geez, I don't think I could have done that. But any of this, you could, you could do there's that. no stroke in there once you understand which one to do after which so one. So if you saw how this was done, the first thing that was done was this. Right? And then it, it goes from there. Goes around. And then a lot of it is what we call aura-ing, which is just tracing outside the existing line. Stuff like that. See, that uh, piece of that, that Rick said was uh, a molding. Yes. Like that white molding. So that's what I got from it. I looked at that, I took notes, and this is what I created from that. in a Zentangle way. So we, there, I mean, there's a lot of patterns, but to do it in a Zentangle way, this is just uh, something that you see on a lot of frames, this very, very simple line, uh, line within, within lines. But then when you put them together in, in curvy lines, that's when they get really crazy. And those, those uh, mirrored wavy lines on that lamp frame were that. And so we had, we had put together a piece that, that incorporates all of the images that we had shown you before. And uh, so we have it here for you to see if and you so want to see it in we, person. Th that's why this is empty. <laughs> oh. So you, you, can, you, can see, you can see that. And, we, and you know that 
all of those things. So, oh, there's the rug, and there's the Tiffany lamp, and, and, uh, and if you notice, this, this frame was, was, uh, was somewhat damaged. Yeah, it was falling apart, so you can see I even tangled so inside we, the frame. So we just used, we just put tangles in, in the uh, empty spaces anything. there. Yeah. So there's raised gold leaf in there. And uh, so I, we, we treated it like, like uh, you know, fine art that it is. It's done on really, really good paper. And, uh, and then we varnished it after, because I wanted it, I didn't want any glass between it and, uh, and us for this particular thing. So, but, but that uh, uh, checkerboard is on the painting, the big painting in there. It's a, we, we showed it. But it had this wonderful ochre color that was so just so rich. So I had to go beyond the black and, and throw a little bit of color in there. But this was so fun to do. Rick and I did this together, and uh, uh, we, we can see the icanthus. You can see the frame. See the one on the left? Or you can see the frame. And then on the bottom, and yeah. Okay, and this over here, up there, uh, molding. molding that yeah. was in there. And what else do we got? We have, uh, oh, this, oh, this is the handle. Yeah. yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Repeated yeah. over and over. The hardware. The hardware, hardware. yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. 